about what advertising could do influenced uh, advertising research. Okay, so so by the 1930s and 1940s, the ad industry is developing. By now, agencies are providing creative services to their clients. That's part and parcel of what they do. They they help them design ads and place them. Uh, but there's trouble brewing for not only ad, ad agencies but for the U.S. economy as a whole. The 1930s, the country faces a huge depression, and a worldwide depression. In the 1940s, the United States from 1941 to 1945 is at war, uh, a two-front war, a war in Europe and a war in the Pacific Ocean. And so advertising as a cultural phenomenon reflects those times. It reflects the priorities of Americans living at that time. The 1950s, uh, the United States assumes its role as the dominant superpower of the world. Uh, uniquely unaffected by the devastation of the Second World War, the U.S. has its factories intact. It has its returning soldiers coming back. And um, what we see is that uh, um, Americans began to enjoy a lifestyle unlike any they'd ever enjoyed before. And in turn, advertisers anxious to inform consumers about their choices in the marketplace begin developing uh, great campaigns. In the 1960s, we have what uh, some people refer to as the golden age of advertising. So if you watch the show Mad Men, um, Don Draper's character in Mad Men is loosely based on the man you see depicted on the far left of this PowerPoint slide, William Bernbach. So William Bernbach was this genius who transformed advertising, who who gave it immense prestige, who, who argued strongly against the philosophy of Claude Hopkins that advertising was a science and that you could just scientifically affect consumers. Bernbach said advertising is an art. And it, it, moreover, it, it, it frequently talks to the consumer as though the consumer were, were, were an, an imbecile. Bernbach believed that that advertising should always tell a story and do it in an intelligent way and that the consumer would respond to that. So you see a couple of great examples of Bernbach's work here. You know, one headline says Avis is only number two. Who, who says their brand is number two? Americans love a winner. So what does Bernbach do? He transforms that into a benefit. Why would being number two be a benefit? Um, well, he came up with the rationale. We try harder. Um, Bernbach says, you know, Hertz, the number one, they're going to take you for granted. We're not at Avis. We're number two. We're ambitious. We want your business. We're going to try harder. It was a brilliant campaign. One of the all-time great campaigns in the middle here. L look at the headline, Lemon. Who makes a headline about their automobile that says Lemon? Well, that was Bernbach's innovation. Um, you look at that ad and you go, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Why would an advertiser call their own product a Lemon? If you read the body copy, what you find out is that car was pulled off the line because of quality controls at Volkswagen. And so the message of the ad actually reinforces the idea that Volkswagens are super reliable cars. But look at the, look at the risk that Bernbach takes in creating that ad. You see in the ad on the right, uh, Bernbach actually at a very early at a very early time in the country also embracing uh, diversity in advertising to an extent that had not been done before. Okay, let's take a look at uh, one of Bernbach's TV commercials. I'm actually Snavely being of sound mind and body to hereby bequeath the following. To my wife Rose, who spent money like there was no tomorrow, I leave $100 and a calendar. To my sons, Rodney and Victor, who spent every dime I ever gave them on fancy cars and fast women, I leave $50 in dimes. To my business partner, Jules, whose only motto was spent, 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 I leave nothing, nothing, nothing. And to my other friends and relatives who also never learned the value of a dollar, I leave a dollar. Finally, to my nephew, Harold, who oft times said, a penny saved is a penny earned, and who also oft times said, gee, Uncle Max, it's your, I leave my entire fortune of $100 billion. All righty. So um, very famous uh, Volkswagen commercial from the 1960s developed by Bernbach's agency, Doyle Dane and Bernbach. 
Um, there, there were other uh, huge personalities, uh, huge personalities from the 1960s. So David Ogilvie, we, we've already talked in class a little bit about David Ogilvie's agency, Ogilvie & Mather. If you remember the Dove commercial we looked at, that comes from the agency named after Ogilvie, who's depicted, a, a, whose photograph is there on the bottom left of the screen. He was a very interesting character. Um, Ogilvie's uh, approach to advertising was this notion of per, uh, personifying the brand, giving it a personality. And so he created these fictional, these fictional characters that stood for the brand. So uh, one of his famous creations was the man in the Hathaway shirt. So is this sort of exotic fellow you see in the, uh, with the eye patch, um, appeared in a number of ads that kind of gave this uh, personality to Hathaway. Then you have Commander Schweppes, uh, the fellow on the the uh, right, more of a, a world traveling adventurer. Um, you know, these were, of course, these were completely made up people uh, who who were portrayed by actors, but they really helped to to give brands a very distinctive personality. And Ogilvy was very influential for that reason. Uh, another big practitioner from the 60s who influenced thinking about advertising was a man named Rosser Reeves. And Reeves developed this idea of the unique selling proposition uh, or USP. So the unique selling proposition is that you should always say something your brand does that's, that's yours and yours alone, that, that nobody can match. So there's lots of chocolate candy, but there's only one type of chocolate candy that will never melt in your hands, and that's M&M. So uh, for years, M&Ms were, were pitched this way, that they melt in your mouth, not in your hands. Um, a, a really brilliant strategy for, for M&Ms. So in the 1970s, of course, uh, time marches on, things change, and uh, you know things in the United States began changing. We see, we see the U.S. facing some uh, some doubts about uh, itself, its role in the world, and some of that's reflected in advertising. There's been a change in advertising. Let's take a look at some Coca-Cola advertising from the beginning of the decade, which is very close to the 60s, I'd and like then the end. To buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and so white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing, sing with me. Okay, so that ad is filmed in 1971, uh, which is really culturally still a part of the 1960s. And, and um, you know, as you looked at that ad, uh, people in today's culture respond very differently than they did then. You might be surprised to know that this, this ad was hugely popular. And this image of bringing together all these young people from di different cultures and places, having them united on this hilltop, singing this song, just struck such a chord. And this ad became so popular, it was really America's favorite ad for a very long period of time. In fact, the, the music of the ad, which, uh, uh, which you just heard, was re-recorded with slightly different non-Coke lyrics and became a, a top 10 radio hit. So people couldn't get enough of this song. That's the beginning of the 70s. Now, um, things uh, began changing as the, uh, as the decade went on. And just to show you how much they had, think about all that optimism and, um, you know, sort of we're all in this together spirit from the early 70s. Now, 1980, just one year at the conclusion after the 70s have ended. Let's see how things have changed. For Mr. Green? Mr. Green? Yeah. You, you need any help? Mm -hmm. I, I just want you to know, I think, I think you're the best ever. Yeah, sure. 
Want my Coke? It's okay. You can have it. No, no. Really, you can have it. Okay. Coke and a smile makes me feel good. Makes me feel nice. See you around. That's the way it should be. I like to say, the whole world is smiling with me. Don't the cold and as life have a good and Thanks, mean Joe. Smile. Okay, so, uh, you know, obviously there's a happy ending there and, uh, um, you know, everything works out in the end. But, um, but what, a different, uh, what a different feeling from that kind of optimism. There's almost a moment in that commercial where maybe the kid, you know, lost faith in his childhood idol, Mean Joe Green, one of the better players for the Pittsburgh Steelers around that point in time. Of course, Coke produces a happy ending, but you can see that the culture, the culture in the United States is absolutely changing. Okay, so uh, now we, we come into the 1980s and the 1990s. The United States begins experiencing, uh, after a dismal, uh, dismal economy in the 70s, the economy begins growing again, and we start to see this trend towards integrated marketing communications that we talked about. So this is really when IMC starts to become important to large uh, advertisers and because advertisers want all of their services all of their messages to be integrated the result is that these uh, what had been independent agencies separate diverse groups begin getting consolidated and bought up by these giant holding companies which now own some of the best advertising brand names in the world so you can see one of these uh, there's four of them you can see one of these large holding companies which is based in new york called the wpp group and look at some of the names in there so you have y and r which is young and rubicon you have ogilvy you have j walter thompson the, uh, these are huge uh, names in the advertising world now all part of a single conglomerate so why is this happening it's happening because big advertisers need big scale. If you're going to advertise globally, you want to go with one of these large consolidated holding companies which can provide all of the services you could possibly need. And um, so now, of course, we're in the 2000s with the digital age. Uh, it's been an explosion of media. The, 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 the challenge for advertisers in, in this point in time is the breakdown of the mass society. So, you know, even through the 1980s, if you advertised on one of the major networks, you were reaching a large number, uh, a large percentage of the adult population in the U.S. Those days are long gone. The networks combined, all of them, have less than 50% uh, of the viewers of television at any one time. TV viewing as a whole is down. Um, this mass society idea that we had is 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 something in the past at this point. Advertisers are demanding accountability. They want to know, hey, are these ads working? Uh, tell me how they're working. And of course, the explosion of social media and the importance that social media uh, plays in your life and in the brands that you use and adopt. Um, a, we know that a friend's recommendation of a brand on Facebook means a lot more than Coca-Cola sending you an ad. So. This is just part of the modern culture. Okay, let's take a look at a modern Coke ad and see how things have changed a little bit. Okay, so um, a clever ad from uh, Coca-Cola, actually posted on Coca-Cola's site, which um, is, we might think of as almost a retro spot, right? So done in a very modern, contemporary way, but hearkening back, you saw images from some of the glorious ad campaigns in Coke's history in that spot. 
And it, it gets back to this notion of the secret formula, right? The thing that makes Coca-Cola taste so great. So a real nice benefit that's being offered in that spot as well. Okay, well, uh, that wraps it up. I hope you've enjoyed this overview of the history of advertising as you, as you think back on what we've talked about. As you read the chapter, try to, uh, again, understand the factors that have led to the development of an advertising industry and then understand some of the basic milestones and the importance of those milestones as advertising has developed in the United States. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.